How many of you guys feel like storming King's Landing? Yeah, is that pretty awesome? Hey, that music there, that's, that's, that's pretty energetic. Great way to start hangover shift. I'm glad you guys could all make it. So that music is from a, a band called Ava. Amazing, I'd like to introduce you to the four composers of the music you guys just heard. There they are in all their glory. Oh, by the way, these are the composers. Those other guys are just tech support. So that music was uh, written by Neural Network with a, with a group. You can go check them out on SoundCloud. They got some amazing stuff. Totally uh, composed on computers for human beings. So that's uh, an introduction to our topic today. I'm Mark Campbell, Chief Innovation Officer here at Trace3, and we're gonna take a look at some of the emerging tech trends in artificial intelligence. So let me just scope this a little bit. Uh, artificial intelligence means a thousand things to a thousand different people, but let's talk about the spectrum. For most of IT's history, we've dealt with what I'll call the simple end of the spectrum. These are procedural algorithms. This is things like Excel, things like um, just regular coded algorithms, things like autopilots on 737s. Um, and we do have, is that, I'm sorry, if any of you guys died in a plane crash, I apologize to you guys. Um, we do have this middle ground that we'll call savvy. You know, certainly a big thing in the 80s going into the 90s, we're talking about inference engines, knowledge bases, and so forth. Uh, then we kind of entered into the AI winter through the 90s and the early 2000s. But recently we've seen the emergence of several artificial intelligence technologies uh, kind of in descending order through uh, machine learning, neural networks, deep learning. There's a lot of great and wonderful stuff uh, hitting the market right now. So we'll call that smart. So we're gonna make a distinction between simple, savvy, and smart. Because there's a ton of hype out there. And basically hype takes the form of a simple or savvy product pretending they are smart. Now we did a series of articles last year talking about six simple questions that you can ask an, uh, any vendor that's purporting to have AI to determine whether they're actually savvy or whether they're smart. Unfortunately, when you look in the media, the media very rarely deals with uh, this center part of the spectrum and they tend to focus on the S to the right, the sentient, right? You know, when are, when are T-1000s going to uh, take over the government? Hopefully, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I, we, we've been investing in this. It's got to start paying off. <laughs> Unfortunately, the media also talks about the S off to the left. <laughs> and, you know, th th this is, these are the articles, you've all seen them out there about, you know, how AI is gonna make your, your life so much simpler and so forth. So we're not gonna focus on either of those two extremes. We're gonna kinda aim for that smart segment. Now when we talk about emerging tech trends, again, emerging tech has a bunch of different meanings to a bunch of different people. This is uh, Jeffrey Moore's uh, technology adoption life cycle. We all know it, we all love it, we all have tattoos of it. There's this chasm right, that when new startups come to market, they kind of have to cross that chasm before they get mainstream adoption. So on the left of that chasm are the innovators and early adopters. Technologies fighting in this space, we call emerging technology. Now what we're gonna do on our little journey today is we're gonna take a look at the leading edge of artificial intelligence technologies coming to market right now. Uh, we're gonna take a look at um, how our customers uh, in the early adopter phase are taking this to production today. We're then gonna move into the cutting edge where we take a look at where our uh, innovator customers are POCing and experimenting with technologies. But kind of interesting, we're gonna take a look beyond that one step. We're gonna take a look at those things that are in PowerPoint out in Silicon Valley right now, things that are in stealth mode, things that haven't GA'd or hit the press yet. Sound fun? It, it better. Okay, so let's start with the leading edge. Now, th these are products and trends that we're seeing within our customer base right now. Uh, certainly on the operations side, there are a ton of products, and, and a bunch of these are, are sponsors out there. Make sure that you visit them. They kind of congeal into about three main categories that we're getting a ton of traction right now. Robotic process automation, AI ops, and smart sec ops. Um, our consulting organization is doing an amazing job. Uh, our data intelligence group has got a, a bunch of procedures for robotic process automation. We, in fact, set up a whole organization called ITOA to handle this AI ops problem, and our security group is one of the sharpest groups in dealing with uh, AI uh, 
applied to the security operations group. So kudos to those folks. We are doing a ton of work in this area. When we go into analytics, we're seeing three big trends in that space. We're seeing AI introduced into data modeling. Um, we have an organization, our Deep Learning Services Group, that is doing a ton of, of work in this space, helping customers develop their own AI, as opposed to AI that's embedded inside of other products. In the data preparation space, we're talking about AI being used to uh, automatically do the ETL process. If you guys have a chance, this company Datalog, that's pretty darn intriguing. We're seeing some terrific traction with them, a very novel approach on that. By the way, I'm not a sales guy. I'm not trying to sell these. I'm just saying they're out there. We're also seeing a trend of analytics being pushed closer to the edge, and there's some great products in that space. But I want to talk about something a little bit closer to home. How, how many of you folks, by round of applause, have data centers? <laughs> nice, nice. I knew that was going to catch on, too. <laughs> so this is probably a topology that, that represents your data center. Not exactly. Um, if you walk into a data center, for those of you who haven't been in a data center, you literally will see orange squares on the, on the ground painted with these, and, and that's how they're organized, exactly. At least the engineers tell me that's the way it is. So AI is going to change this rather substantially, and, and I think it's a little bit subtle, but I think it's very, very important. When we talk about the operations of a data center, typically we're talking about DCIM, data center information management systems. However, when we couple AI with DCIM, we're able to get amazing, um, uh, an amazing jump in productivity. In 2014, Google took DeepMind and embedded it within their DCIM. Uh, and at that stage in 2014, they were using it to provide recommendations to their data center ops group. Um, they saw 40% savings in power and cooling. So they've now taken it across their data centers in 2018. And now DeepMind runs all of the DCIM inside there. So this is terrific. We're also seeing data center ops, the introduction of ITOA. We talked about that before. We're seeing on the actual workflow for uh, problem and issue resolution, not just ITSM, but ITSM coupled with AI ops. And we're seeing smart capacity. This is where instead of just uh, buying for the maximum capacity, we're actually using uh, some AI to, to provision that out. So that's all great if you guys happen to own and operate your own data center. Now, if you're more kind of on the development side of things, um, you're seeing that there are AI models being embedded inside applications. Okay, that's no big surprise. However, a key distinction here is, unlike traditional applications that get uh, transported into production and stay there, this is quite an intriguing trend. AI doesn't necessarily stay static. A lot of AI is actually training and learning in production, which kind of begs the question, how do I get those learnings back into my dev test environment? So that is bringing up this new topic called ML Ops, machine learning operations. And that's a bi-directional type process. Now that's not the unidirectional CD pipeline, and there's a ripple effect that that one little arrow causes. It says that we can no longer put networking around our production environment like some protective moat, and we lower the drawbridge every time we do an enterprise release. This says that that's got to be more of a kind of a highway overpass. So some of the technologies like uh, software-defined networking, intent-based networking, and, and smart micro-segmentation are allowing us to kind of flow in between those a little bit better. But look for products in this space to augment the CI-CD pipeline. Here's another weird thing AI is causing. We mentioned that uh, AI requires uh, data to train. Well, it requires a ton of data to train. So therefore, it's, it's highly probable, depending on, on your application environment and customer base, that you're going to have to do more training uh, in your non-prod environment requiring more data. You're also going to require faster data so that you can get faster training times. This reverses a, a paradigm in storage that's been around ever since we chiseled stuff into granite, and that is that we are probably now going to be taking our fastest, highest capacity uh, storage and putting it in our non-production environments. So the whole idea of we tech refresh into production and we move the old stuff uh, to those dev yahoos, right, that might actually be flipping around. One other change that's going on is right now we have a pretty homogenous view in our data centers when it comes to compute. Pretty much it's dominated by x86 boxes. Now, that's great and wonderful. It's just x86 boxes aren't necessarily the best boxes out there uh, for training AI uh, and, and developing uh, data models based on AI. So therefore, you guys, I know you've seen this. 
you've seen NVIDIA, you've probably seen uh, Xilinx, you've probably even started seeing some ARM-based compute nodes making their way into your data center. And so this, as you can kind of see, the whole screen is green now, right? AI has uh, the potential, depending on how much it's used within your organization, to change some pretty significant plumbing details inside your data center. And if you say, well, yeah, but we use the cloud, guess what, this is what the cloud already looks like, right? So the, moving a little bit now out a bit, moving over into the cutting edge, we're gonna take a look at, now that we've got AI in our data center, we've rebuilt everything we've put in liquid cooling, we've hired a lot of guys with long beards, we've, we've hired a lot of uh, super smart girls out of, out of Cal Berkeley, but now we've got all that running, what exactly are we gonna do with it? The three trends that we are seeing, some of the most innovative uh, customers that we speak with on a regular basis, natural language processing is one. A ton of companies out there. This actually segments into some interesting use cases. Natural language uh, query, I think we've all probably heard about, probably already understand it, but I want you to take a look at some of these other areas. There are conversational APIs where you can actually code to NLP uh, tool sets out there by a, by a number of companies. If we move down the line just a little bit, we've got the object recognition space. Now, this is very prevalent specifically in manufacturing. Uh, you can imagine autonomous vehicles. And the projects that we're collaborating with our customers on, we're seeing one of the first steps in object recognition is the rendering of a 3D conceptual model inside, uh, inside the AI. From that, we're seeing that it isn't just uh, visual data that's being used. Uh, we have customers that are using LiDAR, radar, sonar, ESP. Oh, I made the last one. They're not really using ESP. But um, the idea is to take in a, a number of different sources and, and making a composite 3D model. Uh, some of these companies are doing real-time manipulation. So instead of just taking that 3D model and using it as is, they're applying AI to uh, manipulate that in such a way that it becomes readily more digestible to downstream systems and real world learning. What the heck is that? <laughs> is that? Is that a dog? Is that a sheep? Is that a llama? Is that Tyler on Tuesday? What is that? <laughs> By the way, if anyone said Bedlington Terrier, you own a Bedlington Terrier. But the idea is, look, we've got this great model. All of, the, all of you in the audience right now have this model of identifying animals. All of a sudden you see something, you kind of hiccup. What the, what the heck is that, right? So that is uh, where we mentioned earlier about AI being trained in production. This is, you know, an AI system sees something that's not familiar with, not trained on. How does it react to that? The other one is contextual. Yes, I identify everything in it, but this doesn't matter. Now, in a real world setting, you think of a, like a security uh, uh, scanning device that says, look, there's a person in a parking lot. That's fine, except the context is it's two in the morning and there's no cars in the parking lot and they're up near the gate fiddling with something. So contextually, that's a problem, whereas component-wise, it's not. Now that de depends on two types of technologies. One is semantic segmentation, where you're able to, through uh, object recognition, recognize the object, but it also implies there's instant segmentation where I not just have identified the cars, but one of these cars is on the road, it's that car that's gonna run me over. So if we go into a specific case of object recognition, I know a lot of you are working with facial recognition, either for identification purposes or uh, sometimes customer recognition uh, and, and customer tracking. The trends that we're seeing there, matching. Hey, everyone's phone does this. This isn't rocket science. But once we have matching, we can start categorizing that. In this particular case, what are employees, what are staff, what are visitors? Once we get to that, we can start talking about pathing. Now this is kind of the state of the art right now, where we identify a person and we can track them around through movement such that we can see trends even switching from view to view. This is an area when we talk about analysis of facial recognition that's a little bit controversial, right? There's a lot of subjectivity in here and the bias that goes into training the AI models to pick out characteristics in a human face is a little bit fuzzy right now, but there are a ton of companies that are trying to identify this. By the way, this is also happening with audio too, that this person on the phone is getting very, very angry. Maybe we should take another tack on this. 
filtering. This one's kind of interesting. The idea is that um, as these uh, images are coming in, we're using AI to detect not just the images coming in, but the actual face of the viewer and make filtering decisions based upon that. I wish we would have had that when my kids were that age. Okay, this one's kind of kind of scary cool. This picture was taken February 5th, 2018 in Zhengzhou in the Henan province in China. So just over a year ago, those smart glasses will facially identify everyone that this police officer looks at, will check if they have a warrant or have said anything bad about our people's government. That's a little freaky, right? It probably will never happen in the US. Okay, probably by August. But it's, it's where things are going. And so you can kind of get into this cultural and social debate about, you know, what are the implications of this? What are the ethics of this? So we're kind of delving into some deep waters here. So let's move a little bit deeper. Let's move out to the bleeding edge. Now, we're going to talk about some very... Uh, on the drawing board type things, but I am gonna show you some demos of things that are actually here today that you can see and hear and so forth. So how many of you guys watch this show? Did you guys catch the last episode? Brittany broke up with Greg, right? No, you haven't. None of these people exist, right? These are all AI generated faces. Specifically, they're generated by something called a generative uh, adversarial network or a GAN for short. Now, we're gonna get into some great techie techie stuff, so hang on. What we do is we start out with millions or potentially billions of images. Now, some of them are faces, some of them are not. And we're going to build a device called a discriminator that is going to train on how to identify which are faces and which are not. For you guys that watch Silicon Valley, this is the techie term for hot dog, not hot dog. <laughs> All right, so that's actually, that episode of the show is a legit, a legit technology. Now, once we've got a discriminator that's very, very good, at picking out uh, faces, uh, we're gonna go ahead and make a generator that's gonna send over some images that it gens up. They're not gonna be very good, but the discriminator is gonna say, not hot dog, and it's gonna send it back, and through that feedback process and billions of iterations, the generator gets to a point where the generator can actually generate the images the discriminator can spot, and that's where these types of facial images are coming from. So outside of the generator, we'll get faces like this. Now, I want you to notice a few things here. These are not perfect celebrity type faces. We've got five o'clock shadow, we've got age spots, we've got crow's feet, and that's just me. But notice the lady on the right, look at, look at the earrings. You see the earrings there? For whatever reason, AI just freaks out with earrings, can never get the earrings right. They don't match, or it's cocktail earrings on a truck driver from Indiana. It's, it's, it's for whatever reason, this is the Achilles heel uh, for AI-generated faces right now. So if we go ahead and uh, take a look at some actual things, I, I do want to warn you, some of these are really weird, and some of these are going to be auditorially disturbing, uh, but just, just kind of hang with this. This is a generator, by the way, courtesy of our buddies at NVIDIA, that is training. This is the output from a generator and how it's learning what a face is from a given starting point. And that's kind of freaky, isn't it? But this, this type of... Uh, Facial generation is just one particular example of uh, the data that, that can be generated out of a GAN. Let's take a look at another type of data. Um, we can make synthetic data. So if we take these eight uh, pictures of people, now they could be from AI, they could be actual pictures, we can develop the equivalent of like a multiplication table on these. We can take these two images and cross them, and we can have the generator using these as two seeds generate uh, a whole new image from that. So that means from eight original images, we can get 15, right? I and mean, look at those for a little bit, right? You can see the characteristics being cross-multiplied into those. By the way, I want you to look at the very bottom row. I want you to look at the second uh, image in uh, of the generated data. Earrings are ganked up. She got a red one and she's got a diamond. So there you know, 
proof that it's either someone that can't dress themselves or it's AI generated, right? All right. So. Now, is that kind of freaky? So as the, as the generator was training itself, it, in this particular case, this is from a couple years ago, it was trained to hone in on a particular phrase. We can, jump a, we can jump ahead a year and start looking at generalized AI. So instead of honing in on a particular phrase, what if it took text as a phrase and applied vocal attributes to that? Hey, don't listen to the guy on stage. He is a robot. I am the real Mark Hamill. Just look, his ears don't match. He's computer generated. So this is a... This is output from a neural network that I, that I worked on to train to my goofy voice. Um, so you can kind of see that, that moving from kind of the specific type of training into generalized training, um, that's kind of the trend right now, and that's what we're seeing. If we move ahead one more step down this road. Hello? All right, so what do you guys think? Guy on the left, guy on the right. Okay, raise your hands. Guy on the left. AI? One on the right. AI? How many of you are smart asses and think it's both and I'm trying to trick you? <laughs> How many people think it's one but they pick the other one because they know that's probably the right way to do it? I hate guys like you in traffic. <laughs> okay, the correct answer is the gentleman that was calling in is AI. Now this is from a system called Google Duplex, which was debuted last year, but it's going to be out on iPhone uh, here in the next couple months. Is that kind of wild or what? Now I got thinking if I could take Tyler's voice and using the Lyrebird application from before and combine that together, I should be able to run this company within an hour and a half. <laughs> so. He wouldn't go for it, though. He, 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 wouldn't, he wouldn't provide me audio samples. But this is examples of synthetic data. OK, what is coming next down the pike? My CPU is a zero-led processor. No, 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 no. We said we were not going to go there. Sorry, I just couldn't resist. So it's kind of an interesting thing to try to cast your mind down the road a little bit on where this could end up, right, by generating a bunch of data. Now, readily, it might not be apparent as to what, source, uh, what, what types of problems we could apply tons of data to. But let me get one from the, uh, the uh, AI and healthcare uh, uh, space. So we had a summit, oh, it was uh, I think in mid-March, right around uh, a couple months ago. And we brought in some of the most amazing technologies of using AI in the healthcare space. And uh, we did not have these particular people there, but we did see some products that are kind of going down a similar vein. So the idea here is Massachusetts General and the Mayo Clinic have uh, hundreds of 3D uh, images and hundreds of 4D brain scan images that are annotated by doctors. So that means the doctor has to go ahead and take a look at it, make annotations on it. You know, this is Abby normal and, you know, and all those great classifications. So, from that, they have hundreds of data points. Except remember before we had that uh, multiplication table type effect that we could do? From these sources, they were able to generate millions of annotated MRIs. Now, what do you do with millions of annotated MRIs? Well, certainly you can use it to train more doctors, but in a perverse way, you can actually use it to train AI to spot 
uh, abnormalities in brain scans. So that's kind of an AI creating something to train AI, kind of, kind of a, a scary thing, or really good. Because in this case, we're finding that the output from this particular uh, solution is uh, approaching or exceeding the human ability to find abnormalities in MRIs. Pretty wild, huh? Let's take a look at another example. This is from the oil and gas space. So uh, for any of you guys that are drilling oil wells in your backyard, you know that it's very tricky to get good seismic data. There's all kinds of noise, there's all kinds of echoes, and sometimes you get degraded uh, feedback from the sensors. So in uh, the traditional classic approach, you either go ahead and redo the whole test, or you skip that data and make suboptimal uh, estimations. Well, GANs are being used in the, oil, in the oil and gas industry to fill in that missing data, to take kind of the sketchy type of data and fill that in so that uh, a, a complete analysis can be done. Let's pick another one. Let's go to the security space. There are four GANs out there right now um, for you security folks. There's MALGAN, it generates malware. Uh, IDS GAN, it generates attacks against your perimeter. There's PASS GAN that goes to crack passwords. Um, uh, by the way, I want to point out on, on PASS GAN, the best password cracker out there to date is called Hashcat. The first pass of PASS GAN was 24% better than, than Hashcat. Now, one of the reasons is instead of using kind of this uh, br brute force and uh, uh, kind of algorithmic uh, attack on passwords, it actually is learning human behavior of how human beings select passwords. And once it's learned that pattern, it actually is able to hone in much quicker on uh, the types of passwords it, it can use to crack. And for those security folks that are into steganography, uh, and I'm not gonna get into what steganography is, but if you guys are into steganography and you have steganography detectors out there, there is an SS GAN out there that does that much better. Now I'm gonna loop back to one of them, MALGAN. So MALGAN has the ability of generating millions of pieces of malware, which sounds like a very stupid idea, doesn't it? What would you do with millions of pieces of, of malware? Well, we have a Fortune 100 company that has uh, brought our uh, uh, deep learning con consulting group in to help them put together a prototype on Malgan. Now, the idea here is that if you are a very large target that uh, bad actors love to attack, it is imperative that you have some pretty strong malware defense. Now, the problem with that is, is when you go and do a POC to select your particular uh, perimeter defense, uh, you're gonna get kind of the results that a lot of the benchmarking companies have. However, when you release it into the wild, the bad guys are not nice enough to use malware that was the same that you tested with. They keep writing new stuff. So the idea here is if you can generate millions of new pieces of malware that no one has ever, ever seen before, and yet your perimeter uh, at malware defense is able to intercept, detect, and, and remediate on that, this is a much better scenario. So that's what these folks are doing uh, along with the Trace3 Consulting folks, so a real world example. So we talked about the leading edge, the cutting edge, and the, and the bleeding edge. And to recap, we talked about in the leading edge what customers are actually implementing to production today, both in operations and analytics. Um, uh, by the way, we do have a uh, summit that is coming up in June, AI and Enterprise. Uh, there's still a few seats open, so if you want to bribe, I mean, if you want to talk to your sales team, you probably can get one of the few remaining seats on that. That's June 11th, I believe. Um, we took a look at how the data center is going to be uh, changed, both how AI is going to change the data center and how the data center is going to have to uh, change to support AI. On the cutting edge, we looked at three hot trends that our customers are using to actually ingest the data and process it, using AI for natural language processing, object recognition, and facial recognition. And we took a look at how AI can be used to actually generate the data. We looked at GANs, we looked at synthetic data, and we looked at a couple of cases how folks are, are using this. Well, I thank you all for putting up with me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Evolve.